this is Dr. D. Mento, and you're listening to Sam the Show. Joining us now over the phone is Dr. Demento and John Caffiero. The new album is called Dr. Demento Covered in Punk. It features over two hours of punk versions of songs heard over the years on the Dr. Demento show, featuring artists such as Osaka Popstar, William Shatner, Fred Schneider, Adam West, Joan Jett, Weird Al Yankovic, and many more. Dr. Demento and John, thanks so much for taking the time to speak with me. Pleasure's mine. Thanks for having us. I couldn't have explained that better, though. I could <laughs> stick in a few more artists, of course, like uh, right. maybe the Misfits. Uh, you know, John Caffiero has been the manager of the Misfits for a long time. No That's kidding. true. Yes, I've, I've worked with the Misfits both creatively and in a business capacity for many years now, and uh, it's been an honor. They're a truly iconic punk band uh, right up there with the Ramones, another band I've had the honor of working with over the years. There were such a wide variety of artists on this project. How did you go about inviting them to record? Honestly, I just asked. Um, I would kind of sit around and think about artists that I liked. I mean, the whole project really is a labor of love, and everybody that's on this record is on the record because I genuinely like their work and think that they would be a good fit for the project. So I would think about songs that I'd like to have on the record and or artists that I would like to have on the record and then find whichever I felt was best suited to each other and approach them about it. And nine out of ten times, I would pitch an artist on the track. Like The Misfits, for example, I felt The Cockroach That Ate Cincinnati would be a perfect track if The Misfits were going to do a novelty song. In my opinion, that would be the one that would really suit their persona, and I played it for them, and they really liked it and took to it, so that became the song that they did. Whereas there would be a few other artists, um, for example, Fred Schneider, what I originally had in mind for Fred was to do a punk cover of King Tut, made famous by Steve Martin, because I thought that would translate really well to his sound. But Fred, being a big fan of the Demento show, uh, immediately said, oh, I'd really like to do Fluffy. And in retrospect, I'm glad that he had that in mind because I don't know that I would have thought to do a punk cover of Fluffy, but it was something that Fred felt he wanted to do, and it made me go a little further outside the box than I might have otherwise in terms of my production approach. And I think that the track turned out extremely well, and I love it. It's, it's really great, and it's very indicative of Fred's personality and sound. Yeah, Fluffy, I think, is my favorite cut off of the album. John, did you produce all of the songs? I produced most of the songs, and I executive produced all of them. Fluffy, I personally produced. Um, Cockroach That Ate Cincinnati, I co-produced. Uh, the Vandals, National Brotherhood Week, The Vandals produced themselves. The Dead Milkmen produced their, their own track and sent it in. But the majority of them I did end up producing and had a hand in one way or another, even if I didn't directly produce. Dr. Demento, where did you originally find the song Fluffy? Oh, uh, we just came in the mail one day. Uh, I played uh, I played a couple of cuts by a, a group called Psychotic Pineapple, uh, which is on the same record label. So uh, they knew me from that, and they, they just one day in the mail, the forty five came, and I opened it, and there was Fluffy. So <laughs> for, that was pretty simple. I'd managed to uh, track down Gloria Balsam to make an appearance on the record because I thought it would be great to have her. Right. It's yeah. interesting how there are appearances from the artists in the the little uh, interludes in between where Dr. Demento explains the songs. Yes. Well, that was John's idea, as was the whole album, really. He came up with a concept, and uh, we traded emails. We originally corresponded about uh, another, another artist that John was interested in, but uh, John came to me with this uh, concept, and I said, well, okay, let's go for it. And uh, that was four years ago, and then, so it's taken a while to put itself together, but... Uh, John kept me abreast of things all along the way, let me know what was happening, and uh, so here we are after lots of work and lot, lot, lots of brilliant music. Did you ever have to convince some of the artists to do some of the versions, like, for instance, William Shatner or Adam West, since it's not normally yeah. the kind of music they would do? 
Yeah, some some people took a little bit of coaxing, but I'm really passionate about everything that I do, and this was certainly uh, no different. And um, they were two examples where with William Shatner, I pitched him on it, and he was interested in being involved, but it took a little while to get him to warm up to doing a punk song. He likes a lot of progressive music and originally wanted to do something like Bohemian Rhapsody. Um, which is a great track, but not really something that's suited to specifically the theme of what we were doing. So I pitched him on a number of different songs that I thought would be a good fit for him. And of them, he selected Garbage Man, which I'm thankful that he did because it suited his personality very well, or it suits his personality very well. Um, And then in the case of Adam West, Adam West, expressed some interest but was skeptical and that took a little int- a little prodding and honestly at one point he had passed and then I spoke with him and his um, manager slash agent Fred Westbrook a little bit further and the more that they got to hear what I had in mind and my approach and know more about me uh, the more that they became comfortable with it and the Adam West track is another one of those spotlights on the record I mean ev- I think every track on this record is amazing and that you could literally just play pin the tail on the donkey and land on something that's fantastic. But if I had to pick some of my, my favorites from the record, Adam's track, the thing would certainly be one of them. And his performance was stellar and both he and his agent were thrilled with the end result and actually thanked me after the session for talking them into it, which I was very, very honored. I mean, this is the, the real Batman. <laughs> the guy worked with the three stooges too. So right. it's coming from a, a real, uh, true place of, uh, of history of comedy. And Weird Al Yankovic already had a connection to Dr. Demento before the project started. Oh, yes. Yeah, I was the first to ever play anything of his on the radio. Uh, That was back in 1976 when he was 16 years old. So I certainly saw his talent back then, though I certainly had uh, no idea that he would be as big or his career last as long as it has. But uh, he was great back then at 16, and it's just gotten better since then. Uh, He heard me play... uh, he he started listening to my show in the early 70s and was a regular listener all through the 70s. I imagine he heard Beat on the Brat by the Ramones when I first played that on the show, uh, back when the Ramones record was new in 1976. And so uh, here we are full circle with him doing a, a great rendition of that song. Yeah, if it wasn't for Dr. Demento, we wouldn't know who Weird Al Yankovic is. What was it about Weird Al's sounds that appealed to you so much at that time? Well, that first cassette tape he sent me, it was crudely recorded on one of those cassette players with a little built-in microphone, but he had, he had worked and experimented and, and knew exactly how to balance the sound, uh, how loud to sing and uh, how loud to play the accordion, things like that. And also he'd written a, a very funny song. I mean, not up to what he's written more recently, but uh, back in 1976 when he was 16, the Belvedere Cruising was a was a darn good song, <laughs> and I, I I put it on my show. It was about driving around his hometown in a, the family's Plymouth Belvedere, and it, most of the lyrics have to do with other kinds of cars and how they are no comparison to the Belvedere. Did he later ever express to you that he discovered artists because of your show as well? Oh, yeah, yeah. Certainly, he got introduced to people like Stan Freeberg and Tom Lehrer and Spike Jones from listening to my show. I don't think his parents had any of those records. <laughs> so, uh, so that, you know, so sure. And he's thanked me for that many times and, uh, and often mentioned that when he's interviewed about his own career. And I could say the same thing. I mean, there's a, a lot of the songs that are on the record are songs that I probably would have never heard if it hadn't been for Dr. Demento. And the same goes for the artists that, that created them. Dr. Demento, you've had a long, great career. There's a documentary currently in production about your career? Yes, it is tied up in legal limbo, as we say. We, we hope to be able to, to free it from the bonds in which it is held. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there are attorneys working on that as, as I speak, uh, but, but I really have no new news about it, I'm sorry to say. We, we do have... 80 hours or so of great footage that I hope the world gets to see someday. What is your record collection looking like these days? 
Well, it's still pretty darn big, certainly in, in up into six figures, counting all the different speeds, shapes, and sizes, all the trash and treasures. And believe me, there is lots of trash, some of which is very funny. So, <laughs> so I... It, I, I play, I select all kinds of things from the collection on the show. And, uh, of course, I have digitalized uh, much of it now uh, because it's easier to put radio shows together with digital materials. But uh, I, I quite often, almost almost every week, I'm back there in the stacks of LPs and 78s and cassettes and so on, transferring something new to digital media for use on the show. And sometimes the trash are the treasures. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Some would see Fluffy as an example of that. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> and John, uh, you're, of course, from the group Osaka Popstar. Do you have any pl uh, plans and works for that group at this time? Yeah, absolutely. In fact, there are two brand new Osaka Popstar EPs that are close to completion that I really just need to wrap up and finish that uh, hopefully both will be out this year. And if not both, certainly at least one of them and the other to follow. But yeah, there's a bunch of new material already in the can that I just have to complete. And I'm really looking forward to getting that stuff out. So Osaka Popstar is a punk all-star group, uh, all, but also incorporates anime as well. Yeah, well, it really is just a combination of things that I love. So the identity of Osaka Pop Star is sort of a mix of classic 1970s and 1980s punk rock sensibilities and sounds mixed with anime, comic books, and just all of the pop culture influences that I love all wrapped up in one. So you, some might say the anime aesthetic came in with the album, the first album cover for the album Osaka Pop Star and the American Legends of Punk, which has a very anime look, but coincidentally was done by American artists. It was Butch Lukic, who's worked for Batman Beyond and Batman the Animated Series and Justice League, that actually did the, uh, the front and back cover artwork for me, but at my direction, specifically with sort of an anime look and a little bit of a Teen Titans edge thrown into it. And um, you know, there's punk covers of the uh, Astro Boy and Sailor Moon themes on those records, so that certainly plays into it. And there's original songs that I've written, um, like Shallon Monkeys, that are almost like punk rock versions of uh, anime themes for a series that never existed. So, yeah, that stuff just definitely comes into play, um, just as potent as my influences from the Ramones do. Who designed the artwork for the Dr. Demento Covered in Punk album? Uh, a variety of artists. I'm a huge art aficionado, and I collect artwork, and I'm friends with a lot of underground artists and uh, what some people call uh, lowbrow art, but I don't think there's anything lowbrow about it at all. And um, just like the music, I sought out visual artists that I thought would have the right aesthetic to visualize different ideas that I had in mind for different tracks or different components of the record. So for the album cover, we have Drew Friedman, who is an amazing artist who's done work for everybody from Rolling Stone to Mad Magazine to, uh, you know, The New Yorker. Um, and he did the cover art, which is absolutely amazing. And some of the, the back cover artwork is done by Stephen Blickenstaff, who's an original um, illustrator from punk rock album covers. He's most famously done the Cramps Bad Music for Bad People album cover, but also does a lot of Basil Wolverton-inspired work, which Basil Wol Wolverton is one of my favorite artists. And um, so I had Steve specifically create the, lab the punk rock label, the new label, Demented Punk Records, which launched with this record, Dr. Demento Covered in Punk. Steve did the, um, the logo for Demented Punk, which I specifically wanted with a Wolverton edge, um, but some contemporary punk rock sensibilities thrown into it. And he also created the William Shatner artwork, which is an homage to his own album cover, something I asked him to do, which was recreate the Bad Music for Bad People album cover, which features the song Garbage Man that William Shatner covered for this record, but with Shatner's likeness put into it. And that is just another amazing piece. Um, the artwork for Weird Al's cover of Beat on the Brat or um, Adam West's cover of The Thing uh, and many of the others was done by Neil Camera, who's done a lot of work for Tops, Garbage Pail Kids, Wacky Packages, and even the Mars Attacks card series, the newer versions of Mars Attacks. Um, I could go on and on. I mean, I don't want yeah. to. <laughs> there's a lot, needless to say, there's a lot of amazing visual artists involved in this record. And I think that the artwork and the packaging is just as entertaining as the audio itself. They're really made to uh, 
to give you kind of a double whammy. So it's really worthwhile getting the vinyl version if you can, because it's bigger. Dr. Demento, speaking of all of the artists that you introduced to the American public, one of them is Mm -hmm. Frank Zappa. You interviewed him a number of times. Uh, Can you tell me about some of the experiences you had interviewing him? Well, even before I had the Dr. Demento show, I was introduced to him by a mutual friend. And uh, I think he was quite impressed because uh, I knew something about many of his different, very different, uh, varying musical interests. Everything from street corner doo-wop music to some of the most avant-garde classical composers. And I could talk about both those things. And he didn't often meet people who were like that. So so we kind of hit it off at the beginning. And uh, I wrote about him for Rolling Stone. And then I interviewed him four different times. And he always had trenchant and uh, interesting and often funny things to say. Uh, As time went on, he he became kind of suspicious uh, because so many people got involved in legal conflicts with him. So he started really guarding his words because of that, which was unfortunate, but he still had had wonderful and brilliant things to say. And of course, his his music just kept uh, rolling on to new triumphs all the time, in spite of, again, all the obstacles that the world threw his way. So I just have enormous respect for the man and what he accomplished. I mean, he he left us far too soon, but he, he, he left behind uh, more music than uh, most people who live to be 100 ever do. And you're still doing the radio show, the Dr. Demento show online on your website? Oh, yes. A new show every week. Yeah. And uh, so it's drdemento.com. There is a small charge for the stream because we have to pay royalties on it. We're just like a little bitty radio station, but it's it's one where I can play anything I want. And now that we're just online, I can even play a a few four-letter words now and then that I had to bleep (laughs) before. It's really great because you also get a a whole... um a whole archive of all of the Doc's shows from the 70s to present. It's really a great treasure trove of, uh, of entertainment because you get a new show every week plus the archive, so it's definitely yeah. worth pursuing. I, I love it. Yeah, we have over a thousand older shows in the archive, so we, you can hear how I sounded when I first started. <laughs> <laughs> Which is exactly the way you sound right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm, I think I'm a little more animated now, but other than that... Yeah, I mean, you still you have the same vigor. You just, uh, you're just you more polished now from all of the years of experience, uh, but you still well, sound the way that you did uh, in your youth. Well, I came out of FM rock radio, which in 1970, when I started, tended to be a little more laid back than it is, <laughs> than what you hear now. But uh, So I kind of came out of that. Uh, plus, I, I was really just talking off the cuff in those days. I tend to uh, think a little more ahead of time of what I'm going to say. Uh, more recently. Uh, Once I got on network radio and was heard all over the country, I tended to do that a little more and not just ramble. So so you'll you'll, you'll notice that little difference. How did you go about acquiring all of those thousands of shows for the website? Well, they all belong to me. And you just uploaded them after that? Yeah, well, we, we had saved many of them on cassettes and reel-to-reel tapes. Uh, I would save them just so I could hear them uh, afterward and to hear what I thought was good and what maybe could be improved. But uh, I'll tell you a, a little bit of trivia. I haven't told too many people this. Uh, the reason that a lot of those shows survive is because I would put them on cassette and then send them to my mother so she could hear them because she she didn't she didn't have a radio station near her that where she could hear the show so uh, so af- after when when she got old and uh, needed to sell the house so we my sister and I started looking through the closets and we found all these hundreds of shows so we retrieved them and they're now in the the Dr. Demento archive in the in the care of my official archivist who who lives in Indiana and has a nice temperature controlled room to keep the ball in and he's he's a professional audio engineer so they're in good hands. And is the process for you in the show the same as it always was that you look for records and people send you in things as well? Yeah. Uh I mean the it, 
now that I've been collecting records for so for so long, I maybe don't find new ones that I didn't have very often that are fit for the show. But the stuff that comes in from from people online that, of course, has increased tremendously over the years. Of course, now it comes as MP3s most of the time, rather than cassettes like it used to. Right. <laughs> And that's actually that's actually part of the process of how we met. In fact, I think you'd asked that earlier, and I apologize. I, I don't think I answered it. We got on a different track. But um, I am a big fan of outsider music. And in addition to my work with Osaka Popstar, I produce other artists and work with other artists, put out different records. And um, when the first Osaka Popstar record came out, Osaka Popstar and the American Legends of Punk, I was a guest on Erwin Chusid's show, who's a big um, advocate for outsider music as well. And Erwin played for me an artist named Klaus Beyer, who I'd never heard before. And Klaus Beyer is a German outsider artist who um, made it his lifelong quest to cover the entire Beatles catalog in German language. Wow. But... Yeah, it's amazing. And he did it. And he actually <laughs> completed it a, a few years ago. And um, But the obstacles that Klaus faced is that he does not speak English. He does not sing very well. And um, he doesn't have any of the music beds for the Beatles tracks. So he would take all of the Beatles tracks and then find a little snippet of the music that didn't have any vocals over it edit as much of that content together as possible until he'd create this sort of patchwork version of the song of the instrumental and then translate all the lyrics himself and then sing the song over the music bed. And the result is something really unique and you definitely have to have a certain acquired taste for it, but I absolutely loved it. The first track I heard was Health, which was the Beatles' help. And uh, I immediately said, I've got to get this. Where can you get this stuff? And none of Klaus's records, well, most of them, are not really readily available because it's just sort of an underground thing. So I was put in touch with Klaus's manager. I immediately acquired the entire catalog, absolutely loved it. And then when I was doing interviews on different shows for the, for the Osaka stuff, people were saying, what are you listening to lately? And I would mention Klaus Beyer and explain this whole story. So it got back to Klaus Beyer that I was a fan. And then literally one day out of the blue, completely unexpected in the mail, I got a Klaus Beyer cover version of one of my own original songs in Osaka Pop Star called Shallon Monkeys, which he had done the same, given the same treatment that he'd given the Beatles tracks. And um, I, I immediately was thrilled and thought this was the highest compliment I could receive. And then Klaus's manager asked me, could we put this out? And I said, sure, not only will I give you permission to put it out, if Klaus wants to do a couple of more songs, I'll give him the music beds so he doesn't have to recreate anything. And um, maybe we could put out an EP together as a joint effort. So we did. And then I released as a, a co-release with his uh, label Ansel in Germany, the Klaus Beyer covers Osaka pop star Shallon Affen EP, which is quite an original experience. And I had sent that to Dr. Demento. And then Dr. Demento played uh, Klaus's cover version of uh, Osaka pop stars, Where's the Captain, which is like a punk rock ode to Captain Crunch cereal. And then the doc had played that back to back with the Osaka pop star extra crunchy mix of that song, which takes the track and, um, mixes different uh, sound bites from early Cap'n Crunch commercials from the 60s and 70s into it using um, the cartoons of Jay Ward and uh, voiceovers from Dawes Butler. And he played them back to back, wrote me and said, oh, thank you for sending this stuff in. I, I played it on my show. You might want to check it out. And that's how we were put in touch with each other. And we remained in touch. And maybe six months to a year later, I mentioned the idea that I had for Dr. Demento covered in punk. And here we are, four years later, and it's in the can, a two-hour-plus demented punk extravaganza. Is there anywhere that we can find the Klaus Beyer catalog online right now? There's a little satellite site. If you go to osakapopstar.com forward slash affen, which is A-F-F-E-N, there is a satellite site for the Klaus Beyer covers Osaka pop star Die Shallon Affen EP. So you could see the music video for Shallon Affen. Uh, you could click to order the Die Shallon Affen EP. And then on the lower right of the page are links. And I was close. The website is actually Klaus, K L A U S hyphen Beyer, B E Y E R dot D E. And through there, there are links that you can track down his catalog and learn more about him which I would highly recommend. 
and I'll be doing a new EP. I'll be producing a new Klaus Beyer EP probably later this year for release on Demented Punk. Dr. Demento, one last question. One more artist I wanted to ask you about was Jan Dick, that I know you had known oh, yeah. something about. I know that his identity had kind of been unknown for a long time, but have you come in contact with him at all since he revealed himself to the public? Uh, he sent me another a couple of CDs, but no, I've never met him. So I, I have not gone to Houston to, to find him in person. But, okay. <laughs> uh, but we're, we're still, I guess, about as much in touch as we ever were. He started sending me his... Uh, his works uh, on vinyl LPs long before he he revealed himself. So uh, I I was in the you know there's a documentary about him right uh, yeah which which is pre reveal uh, but but I appeared in that. Such str- interesting music. Well, yeah, I I don't I don't know how interesting, but uh, <laughs> uh, in, in small doses it's certainly. Yeah. Uh, it's a little more interesting, I guess, uh, when we when you can like watch him on video. The other albums, they they have their moments. I I am I am not quite enough of a fan of stuff like that to listen for hours at end. But I know some people are. Some people the the, the worse something sounds, the better they like it. There, <laughs> you know. I I love. I, I do have a, a a love for outsider music. Uh, I like it better when they're good musicians. Uh, the uh, the rest I can certainly handle in small doses, uh, but a little goes a long way with a lot of it. John, did you have other um, releases that you wanted to discuss for the Demented Punk label? Um, I'm not ready to discuss them yet, but um, there are definitely a number of things that I'm planning for the Demented Punk label that I think if you like this record, you will enjoy, and I'm sure many of them will end up on the airwaves of the Doc's Weekly Show. Um, but one I guess I could mention is that we're already talking about doing Dr. Demento Covered in Punk Volume 2. Uh, we, we had such a great time doing this project, and people have enjoyed it as much as we have put in, putting it together. Um, so it's been a pleasant surprise to see the strong reaction that the record has received, because again, the, the whole thing really was just a labor of love. It's something I wanted to hear and see. And I just decided to take it upon myself to do it with the doc's blessing, of course, and contributions. And um, we're going to do another one. So at some point in the not too distant future, there'll be another Dr. Demento covered in punk volume on Demented Punk. But there are other releases, some from some of the artists that you hear on this record, others that it's just too soon to reveal. But um, when the time comes, I'd be happy to speak with you about them if you'd like. I'm just always hesitant to give out too much information about things until they're done. Um, because right. it just kind of blows the, uh, it dilutes the intensity of them when they're ready. Well, I encourage everyone to check out the new record, Dr. Demento, Covered in Punk. It's such a cool project. Dr. Demento and John, thank you so much for speaking with me this evening. And good luck with your upcoming projects for this year. Thank Thank you very much. much. Thanks for the airtime. And uh, please let your listeners know if they're interested in knowing more to uh, check out CoveredInPunk.com. They can sample tracks. They could even order online. There's a Splatter-exclusive variant that's only available through the Demented Punk online store. And for people that want to keep up with the Doc's show, make sure they check out drdemento.com and uh, they can hear a new show every week and his archives from 70s to present. Don't forget to stay deep.